Greg's going to make a start. Thank you so much for coming. Um, good evening. Uh, and uh, welcome to this, uh, back to this satellite event for a larger festival called the Battle of Ideas, which is held annually in London um, every year. So it was, uh, what was it, three weeks ago uh, in London. Um, it's a, a festival of debate. There are, I think, about 300 speakers and almost 4,000 people that attend over the course of a weekend. So it's worthwhile to look into it for next year. There's a range of satellite events that are carried out across Europe, um, from Liverpool to Swansea to Athens. <laughs> um, and so this is a satellite event. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank the Battle of Ideas for um, uh, helping me to organize this, and also the Be Reasonable campaign who kind of sponsored the event. And there are some materials over there if you're interested um, in looking at their campaign. So the title of this debate is, um, Children's well-being, the state versus parents? Question uh, mark. So over the past decade or more, the, con the concept of well-being has emerged onto the public agenda, uh, with children's well-being uh, representing a particular area of concern and interest for policymakers, campaigners, and the public. Um, speaking about the Welsh Assembly steps toward removing the defense of reasonable chastisement for parents to use <coughs> corporal punishment to discipline their children, Health Minister Julie Morgan said that it's the state's job to create the sort of atmosphere where using physical violence is wrong. She added, who is bringing up the child, the state or the parents? It should be the parents with guidance and protection from the state. In this way, an increased concern of managing child well-being appears to also lead to more positive forms of stipulating correct parental behaviors, sometimes using the law to do so. So this shift from a focus on harm to children to a more diffuse concern with well-being appears to have gone hand in hand with greater tolerance of state intervention into family life. Um, so in the quest to improve child well-being, have parents and policymakers come to occupy adversarial roles? What is the proper relationship between the state and the family? Uh, is there an, an inevitable tension between the state and parental authority? Has the concern for well-being lowered the bar for intervention into family life? And if so, should such moves be welcomed or resisted? With me to discuss these issues in the order that they will speak, we have Gideon Calder, who's associate professor uh, at, uh, uh, in the Department of Public Health Policy and Social Sciences at Swansea. Uh, uh, author of How Inequality Runs in Families. Uh, we have uh, Ellie Lee to my far right, Professor of Family and Parenting Research at the University of Kent, Canterbury, and the head of the Center for Parenting Culture Studies. Is that right? Correct. Uh, and to my immediate right, Dr. Stuart Waiton, Senior Lecturer Sociology, uh, in Sociology and Criminology, Aberdeen University, author of, of Scared of the Kids, Curfews, Crime, and the Regulation of young people. So how this will work is they will each speak for about five to seven minutes, and then I will ask a, a question to bring together some of the strands of, of the discussion on the panel before I bring it out to you, um, and hopefully engage in um, some lively back and forth. So I encourage you, if you have any comments, it doesn't even have to be a question, to put up your hand and jump in. So without further ado. Thank you very much, Ashley, and thank you for the invitation. Um, my background is in kind of social justice research, so I'm interested primarily in ideas on the one hand, but also in how they kind of hook up with what we know about the real world. So some people think about values in a very abstract way, I prefer to think about them in connection with the best available knowledge we have about how the world actually is, rather than just have very fancy, idealised debates about how it might be in some kind of future utopia. Um, having said that, though, I think, I think I'd primarily like to talk about values today. So I'd like to talk about why it is that we might experience some tensions when we think about the state and parents and children, and why that raises some very difficult questions for us. And although uh, I suspect I'm going to take a different line on many of those questions from my fellow speakers, I think that the tensions, the problems, are the same for all of us. So what we tend to do is we come down on one side or another of a kind of difficult dilemma a lot of the time. And in particular, I think when you're thinking about these kinds of issues, one way of looking at the dilemma is that, on the one hand, we really tend to care about how children are getting on. Right? We, we care about their life chances, their welfare, their future prospects, and we wouldn't want any children to be systematically disadvantaged in society. We would regard, regard that kind of inequality amongst children 
as probably worse than similar inequality amongst adults. So in some ways it is worse if children are having a bad time. It's especially worse if children are having a bad time in ways which then lock them into future poor prospects. Okay? I think most people care about this, regardless actually of their political persuasion. That's one thing we care about. Another thing we care about is something which you could call parental autonomy or family autonomy. So you could say we also care about family life and the unique kind of valuable stuff that you get from family life. So there are relationships and good things that happen in families that you really don't get anywhere else. I think most people would also recognize that. That doesn't mean all families are fantastic, some families are horrible places to be, and abusive and neglectful and all the other things. But most people would recognize that there are just that, there are uniquely, potentially uniquely valuable things about families. Many of the things about our own lives that we value the most, we have good reason to associate with our families. And a lot of that comes from the kind of environment that a family is. And it's really not somewhere which is like under state control. When we're thinking about family life, we're often thinking about things which are very different from the public sphere. The domestic stuff is quite different. <coughs> so, if most of us think there's something valuable about family life, and the kind of decisions that we make there and being in control of things there, but there's also something very important about something like equality for children, then we've got attention because lots of the things that families do get right in the way of equality for children. So if you leave parents completely alone to make all the decisions that they might like about their children, that will mean that children have very unequal prospects in them. The children of the rich will be much better placed than the children of the poor. The children of the people with, who are expert parents will be in a much better position than the children of people who find parenting a real struggle. So society sounds like, if you, if you are bothered about the equality of children, then it sounds like society has a kind of responsibility to make sure that all children are doing all right. Now, every time anything is done to promote that, there is a lot of resistance to it. And there's a lot of resistance to it which comes from the family autonomy kind of angle, right? So a lot of things which are done in the name of healthcare or education, which seek to level the playing field for all the children, are resisted because they sound like nanny status or interference or whatever. So compulsory education, when it was brought in in the 1860s in the United Kingdom, was, it wasn't the United Kingdom then, it was uh, England. Anyway, um, was fiercely resisted by many people who thought it took away the right of parents to decide to do things differently for their children. Now you had to send your children to school. Not only did this take away parental choice, but it took away income from households because children worked. So uh, now they'd be at school, and uh, that would be uh, how are you going to you know, make up the loss of income that this would incur, which was a very real set of concerns and an entirely valid set of concerns. However, looking back, there are relatively few advocates of non compulsory education. Right? So, what does that tell you? It tells you that what looks like an existential threat to family life was actually not. It was actually something which probably, in its way, has served to reinforce many of the valuable things about family life, which come from, for example, having better educated children. That's not some kind of nuclear bomb that you put under the family. That's something to which families adapt very well, actually. And similarly, the loss of family income that comes from kids not working was something to which families adapted very well in very many ways. Right? Reason to say that is that there's an assumption, I think, that people often make in saying that the state goes too far, or is going too far on this occasion, <coughs> that somehow the way things already are are somehow fine, or natural, or normal, or, or fixed, like just everything, and the state getting in there will mess them up. And it seems to me, as somebody who's not an advocate of state dependence for its own sake, or the idea that the state somehow knows best about things, it seems to me that that's just an epistemic mistake. The idea that somehow the state the state always messes things up when it intervenes in the family is just not credible. It's no more credible than the idea that families are always fantastic places and they always know what's best for their children. Also not credible. Neither of those things is credible. We live in a very messy world where probably the best thing that we can do is guarantee some kind of basic level of protection and uh, kind of, pro uh, I don't know the best way to put this, promotion of the prospects of children regardless of who they are and regardless of what family circumstances they live in, right? So my position on certain kinds of intervention of the sort that we might discuss tonight, I'm trying not to discuss particular examples, it's just that 
you take it on its merits, and you think, well, it, are there good reasons for societies to intervene to protect or promote the, the prospects for children in this particular case? Is this a case where there's something so uniquely valuable about families that this is going to trample all over it and remove something which is uniquely fantastic about families? And if there isn't, then there's no good reason to object to it as such. And the, as, the last final point I'd like to say is that state intervention is never an end in itself, at least not in the version that I've ever seen it justified. It's a means to some kind of other end. Right? So the state is just a messy bunch of tools that we use in order to achieve something that we think is very You could either say something like equal life chances for children is not a valuable thing to try to do, or you can complain about this or that messy attempt to try and promote it, but the very idea that we shouldn't try to promote it, I just think is mistaking a cart for a horse. And the idea that somehow we know in advance that family life is already so fantastic that the state shouldn't try to be further in it is just a kind of mistake. Thank you very much, Ashley. I've finished my sentence. <laughs> uh, Ellie. Thanks, and yeah, thanks also for um, inviting me to come. I'm not sure that we're necessarily entirely polar listening to what you've got to say. Um, I think it does come down to what you think um, different agencies in society um, are doing uh, when they're trying to pursue the um, purported goal of supporting families um, or um, encouraging a culture um, which is um, positive and productive. And to pursue what I've got to say, I wanted to comment on positive parenting. <coughs> and the rise of it, which predates um, this particular proposal. Um, it's a, something that's gone on over um, a couple of decades. Um, it's now very thoroughgoing, um, but within this particular proposal, um, is presented to us um, as the alternative which people should look to um, and see positively um, as uh, smacking um, is made into a criminal offence. Um, so within the proposals from the Welsh Government, the argument is uh, that what parents should do um, is instead um, look to much wider provision of positive parenting programmes. Um, I'm sure you must have heard of some of these. They're like Triple P, Incredible Years. The one that is very, well, I would say fetishised in a rather peculiar way in this document um, is a kind of behaviourist version of positive parenting. Um, which in this document is organised around what I would see as a real fixation with the time out. It's presented as this kind of magic bullet to pretty much anything. Um, anyway, um, I wanted to talk about that and what, there's lots of things in this document I disagree with and I think um, are wrong where there's very big misunderstandings of things but the particular sentence that I wanted to use as my point of departure says that this positive parenting approach um, is commonly referred to as authoritative. And I think that's completely wrong, um, and I want to explain why. Because the way that I see the ascent of positive parenting is actually to do with um, the kind of sucking away um, from parents, um, who I see as a species of adults in society, of their authoritativeness. So I think that the rise of positive parenting takes place through a kind of removal um, or a reduction um, of the capacity for parents as adults to be authoritative. Um, it doesn't necessarily do that completely. Um, it doesn't necessarily completely um, undermine the possibility of authoritativeness. But I think it creates uh, what my colleague Frank Verady um, has called something called shared authority. Where all the time what it suggests to parents is that in relation to their authority as adults, um, doing what they need to do with their children um, and as adults in the society, they all the time need to be looking towards the parent trainers. Um, so they need to be uh, deferring to um, those who run the programmes, go along to the programmes, teach them how to learn the performance um, of the time out or whatever it is, um, that that's where their um, authority originates. Um, and I think what that does um, is to substantively change an understanding that we might have of authoritativeness about where we get it from. Because I actually don't think we get it from parent trainers. I don't think parents as adults in society, as they're trying to understand what they need to do with children. You know, being a parent and being an adult in society, it is actually a weighty responsibility. It needs to be seen as such. It does involve responsibility. 
Um, and I think that when you transform that into something which you can only obtain and only enact through looking to others to give it to you, um, it ceases to be authority properly understood. Now, I don't know whether that's clear or not clear, but the way I wanted to just develop this point a little bit more um, is through talking about Diana Barrymore. Um, I don't know if any of you know her work, have you heard of Diana Barrymore? Well, the reason why she's important in this discussion, um, she's a, was, she's dead now, but she's an American clinical psychologist who actually was the architect of the concept of authoritative parenting. It was her term. Um, and she uh, came up with this term through a, a long, long process, an extremely prolific process of writing, through which she explicated an idea um, of how as parents we should relate to children in an authoritative way. And one of the things I find most um, disconcerting about this document, and why I would argue for people to be very suspicious of what the, the Welsh Government's saying, is that whoever wrote this doesn't know what they're writing about, they don't understand the concepts that they're dealing with, and they certainly don't understand what Diana Barrymore was ever talking about. So I just want to go through three points that she made in her explication of how she understood authoritativeness as the basis for parents as adults doing the right thing with children, to try and take our children forward um, and do something which, which can be helpful. And I think that hopefully through saying this, um, some points might become clear about how different this is to what's now called positive parenting. The first thing to uh, understand about um, her idea is that what she was interested in actually didn't begin with discipline. Um, so this whole discussion has got completely obsessed with whether you smack um, or whether you use time out. Um, and I think it's become a very kind of paltry, narrow and helpful discussion. Her idea was much, much wider because what she was really interested in is the larger question of socialisation. How as adult society, we socialise the new generation that we're trying to bring into our world and do something with and develop. So she was really interested in a generational relationship between adults and parents as a subset of adults and the new people that we're trying to socialise and develop, that's to say our kids. And she put it this way in terms of what the task is. She said that the aim of adulthood and parents as part of this is to develop behaviour which, well socialised, is also willful and independent. Now I think that is an absolutely beautiful summary of what we should be trying to do as grown-ups um, as we relate to our children. What we need to do is first of all bring them into our world, get them to understand our rules, get them to be socialised in order to place them into a position where they can then act willfully and independently and take the culture and the society forward. So do you see what I mean? It's a much bigger idea than this little question that everybody's really getting hung up on about whether you smack or you don't smack. It's an idea about what we're trying to do as we develop our children. That's the first point. The second point in, in relation to discipline specifically is a component of this is that she saw discipline um, as important, but had a view of it which was very sensitive to the development of a child across their life, from being a young child into an older child. And her point about what she called aversive discipline, and she didn't fetishise smacking, but she certainly saw smacking as something which could be used as a form of aversive discipline. She said that within the context of an authoritative child rearing relationship, Aversive discipline, including spanking, is well accepted by the young child, effective in managing short-term misbehaviour and has no documented harmful long-term effects. Now the reason why she said that was if you're dealing with little children and they're having a tantrum, her view was that they're just too young to be reasoned with, you just need to stop the tantrum um, and then you need to move on to something else. And that's part of the socialisation process for very young children. It's very different to what you're doing as a child then develops and, and becomes older. So that was the, the confined nature. And she, she was really just contrasting it um, to other things you need to do. Okay, I've got a third point to make about her view on the, the severe caution that needs to be associated with trying to impose alternatives on people and using the law. But perhaps we can go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I stand up or is, do I have to stay for the camera? Uh, 
Uh, can you stay seated if that's all right? <laughs> you can wave your arms around as much as you like. I've been sitting on the train since half nine from Dundee this morning, but I'll, uh, <coughs> if I fall asleep, someone just slap me very hard. Uh, right, okay. Um, uh, I am going to try and uh, prove to you that the people who talk about well being, the caring, nice people, are actually horrible authoritarians. There may be some of you in the room, but we can cuddle later after we've had an argument. Um, I live in Scotland. <coughs> I oppose the ban which has now been introduced in Scotland. Um, and I went to the Scottish Parliament and had to give a submission to the committee where my, kind of my head exploded and I started to scream at everyone in the room. Uh, so I'm just going to scream a little bit now for a few minutes and then you can scream back at me or whatever. So here we go. Uh, in season two of Peaky Blinders, hopefully you've all seen it, if you haven't you should, uh, the vicious Major Chester Campbell attempts to control our hero Tommy Shelby. And he does this by locking up and beating his family. Uh, he explains to Tommy in his thick Belfast accent that sometimes going to do the accent but you won't. To make sure your dog obeys you, you have to show it the stick once in a while and he waves the stick. Uh, watching this, uh, I'm fairly sure that members of the enlightened elite who have just made smacking your child a criminal offence in Scotland will see themselves in the role of Tommy Shelby, battling the backward, brutal traditionalists who use violence to get their way. But as parents are about to find out, the reality is that today's elite represent a modern version of Chester Campbell, using the stick of law and order to force us to accept their ways. Today's authoritarians are very different to the old establishment. They use legalistic and therapeutic talk of rights and protections. They no longer bellow instructions of thou shalt, but hide behind the children's voice or the child's voice to justify their own uh, beliefs and prejudices. The brutality of the Smacking Act, uh, which was passed last month, will mean that a light tap on the hand that, or on the bottom of a child, will be a criminal offence. Hard smacking is already illegal, uh, but to these middle class anti-smacking zealots, that wasn't enough. Uh, children, they argue, need, to use their terms, equal protection from assault. Uh, the very language uh, that they use, I think, is alien to millions of parents who occasionally smack rather than assault their children. Parents know that smacking a child is a form of discipline done out of love and concern rather than something that is abusive uh, and criminal. The zealots talk about children and, and adults as if they are the same, needing equal protection under the law. But ordinary people, indeed society, knows that children are not the same as adults. We cannot ground adults, we cannot confiscate their phones, and we cannot send them to their room. If we did, we would be breaking the law. But why not have a law against grounding? Why not? Especially now that in Scotland emotional abuse is also a crime, why should grounding a child not be made illegal? Surely we can argue it is emotionally abusive. Surely that should also be a crime. It is debatable whether smacking is the best form of discipline for children, but rather than debate or discuss with the public, the majority of whom disagree with them, uh, as politicians could and should, they treat parents like dogs that need to be shown the stick. They pass a law and threaten us with the brute force of the state and the police. And this law could destroy lives, seriously destroy them, mean that people can perhaps never work again because they will be defined as child abusers. Uh, my mother is a child abuser, my grandmother also. I have abused my own children. I have a long family 
uh, of abuse in my family. No longer do we treat adults as citizens who have an opinion and a basic level of autonomy to raise their children. We have what they call the need for a culture change imposed from on high. We are made aware by the new authoritarians holding the stick above us. The Smacking Act in Scotland is a disgrace. It is a form of brutality that undermines parents. It weakens the meaning of freedom. And it will go on to destroy many loving families who dare to think and act differently to the modern elite. Thank you. Okay, so I think Gideon has provided some useful context for the discussion. So um, states have for a very long time stepped in to try and to en intervene into the life of children um, in ways that have been progressive. Um, people who are rich, people who are, for whatever circumstances, are able to spend more time and energy on parenting, may be advantaging their children. And one argument that is often made is that um, the science is clear that children who are smacked uh, or, or who, you know, who are subject to particular parenting methods are disadvantaged. Um, and, and, and when it comes to smacking, the argument is often made, there is no debate, the science has spoken. Um, and so there's a disadvantage there. So this, should the state not step in to try and level the playing field? Um, so that's just what, something that I wanted to put to the panel. But for, 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 for Gideon, what about um, using, you, you said that the, the state often um, intervenes to promote sort of equality and to improve prospects. Do you think it's okay to use sort of punitive measures to do that? Or is that a step too far? Is that something where we would draw the line? Um, so yeah, should we encourage behaviors that will level the playing field? Um, at, particularly with the evidence base that's often that's uh, put forward in this debate. So you just sort of jump in, and if you have a question for each other, if you want to pick up on anything that anyone has said, yeah. Um, well, until recently, um, the thing about education that Gideon mentioned at the start, you know, compulsory education, that must be good. I would have kind of nodded my head and I thought, well, that's an interesting one. And then I was at a talk this year where a man who's done research on this made an interesting observation, which uh, I was a bit surprised at, I must admit. And he, his research was in Newcastle at the time when they were trying to make education compulsory in the 19th century. And he said his research shows that in Newcastle, 97% of children were being educated already before they had compulsory education. And most of those children were being, their parents were actually paying a certain amount. You had these schools set up that where they were paying because parents wanted their kids to have uh, an education. This is, but then the state starts to get involved and say, we must have compulsory education, we must have compulsory education. And their key concern was not the lack of education, it was that there wasn't enough religion in schools. Uh, they weren't getting the correct moral education as far as the state was concerned. So perhaps we should be a little more inquisitive about when the state does step in to set up these wonderful things because in many respects, that was not done then, arguably, um, for the good of children and uh, parents. It was done as a form of moralizing to try and teach kids how to have the correct Christian moral values. So in a sense, it was almost a form of, they had an authoritarian <laughs> elitist dynamic to it, rather than being something to do with uh, uh, families and children. So. Um, I just think it's perhaps worth throwing that out that <clears throat> when these big state things are introduced, perhaps we should be a little bit more questioning about the process. Although, I mean, my point was not that at the time the intentions were pure and the same that uh, would be couched in the same language that they would be now. It's just that my, my point was that now there's, a, there's an equality of life chances argument for compulsory education, which is very hard to argue against, even if originally the world was other than two. So, the, and at the time, the, the objections to that might have been very similar to the kinds of objections that you might have to interventions on the other side of the, on the On the point about um, 
putative responses. I think that's a, that, that's a very interesting question. But you can't have, I mean, the, unless, unless you, you, you could be, I suppose, completely agnostic on the question of, of, of all forms of parenting and just say, well, there is no, I was going to put this to Stuart actually, because it sounded like you might be suggesting at this one stage. Uh, you, you could be saying that there is no really better or worse parenting, there's just what parents decide to do, because somehow, automatically, or by default, or as some kind of logical thing, what parents do is already in the best inter interest of their children. But that's not going to be the case, right? The, the parents could do all sorts of things which are clearly not necessary. I mean, whether out of, uh, you know, bad intentions or good ones, or whether for whatever reason, it's, it's not the case that all parenting, no, nobody cares about parenting but say that all parenting is equally good, right? And if there is some parenting which is, uh, uh, in principle, if there is some parenting which is really pretty large, you're going to have state intervention. That's going to include, it's going to have to include some kinds of punitive responses. By the way, I would say that, um, in many ways, for, for reasons which are often very sad uh, and tragic, that would include interventions to uh, take kids away from their parents for completely separate kinds of reasons to do with, um, you know, uh, substance misuse or, or chaotic lifestyles or all the other reasons why most people would probably think there has to be some kind of provision for child welfare rather than just leaving people automatically in the hands of their parents. They are punitive. If you listen to the stories of people who've had their kids taken away, it feels like a punishment. It's really not very nice. It's a, it's a, it's a tragic and often uh, very long-lasting injury to a person of their child taken away. That doesn't mean we don't think it's all right. So that's a form of punitive intervention, which I suspect most people would think, we need to get it right, we need to make sure the rules are okay, but that kind of intervention has to be part of some kind of a civilized society. Like we don't just need kids to take their chances with whichever parents they happen to have. Well, I mean, so that whole question of child removals, I mean, there's a massive amount to discuss about that, because Sorry, of just how that. extensive it's now becoming. Um, and how it's becoming um, a much more first line reaction. Um, so, I mean, that's most certainly going on. But in terms of your kind of general point about us needing to have a culture and a society through which, as adults, we can have serious discussions and serious consideration about um, how we do the best for the new generation, that's absolutely what we need. But the point about what's going on, um, and it's been going on for a very long time, and I think what's happening at the moment, and it's interesting to discuss that it's the two devolved nations where this is happening most, the drive to foreclose and shut down the possibility of having any serious discussion with grown-ups in general, with adults, and parents as a subset of adults, about what's the best thing to do with our children to bring them into our world, I think it is quite remarkable. And that's what I was trying to say about the parody of um, any serious discussion about this within this document. It's, you know, the people who have written this and the people who are doing this are completely uninterested in having any serious discussion about how we develop the sorts of new adults in the world that Bowery was so interested in. It's a million miles away from what's here. And what's going on here is really a bureaucratic imposition. Um, it looks to me like it's the Welsh Government trying to um, define a mission for itself in relation to the UN and international agencies. It's really about the Welsh Government and the Welsh Government saying this is what we stand for. Entirely um, oblivious to the sorts of discussions we need, need to be having. And I think it's very, very damaging. I mean, I think Stuart's right is that, you know, what's so uh, bad about what's going on here is that it's really not treating people who live in this country as adults. It's not treating parents as adults who absolutely deserve to be involved in a proper thoroughgoing discussion about how we socialize our children and how we turn them into the willful, morally autonomous people that we need to take our society forward. And I think it's so dismal, it's so um, pessimistic, it's so giving up on everything. And I think that that is, in a, in a much longer term sense, really ingrained in this whole rise of parenting as the solution to any problem you've got going, because it isn't. Parenting doesn't solve poverty. You can't get rid of, you can't parent out poverty. 
right? So, you know, from the new Labour government <coughs> onwards, they've been trying to tell us that this is the case. Well, that's because they've given up on trying to have any energetic programme of economic development which can give people decent jobs and better wages. That's how you solve poverty, right? You don't do it through getting people to learn how to use time out. That is not going to get rid of poverty. In the course of doing all of this, I think, by the way, they have also pretty much got themselves into a situation where they've destroyed any proper project of education. Because through saying that education is the solution to all these problems, as any of us know that work in universities, the whole proper idea of education for education, for its own sake, is something we bequeath our children because in its own right it is an, um, an important thing. That has also been completely destroyed. And it clearly isn't working. Right? Anybody knows this who's got children going to, through school and going to university. It's not giving people brilliant jobs and fantastic lives, is it? Well, that's because it, it couldn't in and of itself. What it could do is help people understand the world better. But all these fantastic projects that we can do as adults, with our children, with new young people, what we can do with them, how we can encourage them to make the world anew, that is all just being completely set aside in this kind of parody of something which is presented as helpful, as a, you know, go along to a parenting class. And I think it's absolutely terrible. And you know, the, whole, the smacking debate, it's just a, it's, it's just a, a real, it just really focuses the narrowness and the banality <coughs> of what governments are now like, that this would become what they're fixated on. You know, when as adults, we just need to do an awful lot better than this. I mean, this is no good. You know, we 